you know, because I know at the center of this conversation is really about money, is to take back our relationship, redefine our relationship with source, because resource is an extension of source. Welcome back to season two of the How We Can Heal podcast. I so enjoyed sharing season one with you, and we have some incredible guests coming on for season two. I created this podcast because the hard times seem to just keep on coming these days. These guests and I have committed our lives to healing work and to fostering health and joy in the world, even as we work through the impacts of trauma and face deep challenges. So let's dive in and let's all keep talking about how we can heal. Welcome everyone. Our guest today is Raw Goddess. Raw Goddess is the entrepreneurial soul coach behind hundreds of breakthrough change makers, cultural visionaries, and social entrepreneurs. From multiple New York Times bestsellers to multi-million dollar social enterprises, Raw's unique methodology has empowered a new generation of conscious entrepreneurs to stay true, get paid, and do good. From the onset of her more than 30-year career as a cultural innovator, social impact strategist, and creative change agent, Raw has drawn on the power of creativity, culture, and community to move hearts, minds, and policy. Raw's book, The Calling by St. Martin's Press, leverages her unique methodology into a step-by-step blueprint for finding your purpose and making your most profitable contribution. Raw and I connected through Gabby Bernstein, who was the first guest on this podcast. I recently dove into Raw's course, Making Money, Making Change, and felt it to be filled with love, possibility, and deep opportunities for healing. I am thrilled to have her as a guest here today. So let's get to it and welcome Raw to the show. All right, here we are, Raw Goddess. Thank you so much for coming on the How We Can Heal podcast. It is my joy, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so, so happy to have you here. I was just sharing with you, I, by Gabby's recommendation, read your book, Making Money, Making Change. And I was like <laughs> singing along with it, laughing along with you, like praising, hallelujah. Like I, I felt like you were in my head. And I know people say, you know, when you're writing to really connect with people. So well done there. And I also feel like uh, there's a lot, there's a lot we can talk about. So we'll start uh, breaking that down in a minute. Awesome. So you're talking about the book, The Calling, and then the course, the audio course. The course. Make it change. Audio course. Okay. I was like, audio book, at least I didn't call it a book on tape. I've, done, I've been known to do that. All good. All good. Right. The book, The Calling, and the course, right? Yeah. Because you did call it a course during it and I was just is it in print anywhere or is it only on on so the book is in print the calling is in print and audio but making money making changes is the audio course yeah got it got it okay that's why I was like why isn't money making money making change in your in your email signature and that's why because it's Mm -hmm. they're they're paired Mm -hmm. so I've heard a little bit about your journey you share in the course and in other places um and I you know love to know everything but I was kind of thinking like where to start there because there's always so much to say right in terms of introducing your journey and I was curious about what's your first memory of wanting to help someone my parents were born in the 1920s in this country and 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 I often share this you know survived over two decades of Jim Crow segregation raised four kids um I am the baby um, the change of life, baby. They had me when they were in their forties, which is crazy, but it's true. Y'all doing the math. I can see you now. <laughs> but, um, what I remember is that my mother always, because of the way in which they had to fight for the most basic dignities, um, would say there, but for the grace of God, go I. And it instilled in us at a deep, deep level. If you ever had an opportunity, if you ever had a, uh, any kind of advantage, then you had a responsibility to share. You had a responsibility to make a way for someone else. So it's like when you ask me what my earliest memory is, it's like I don't ever remember not wanting to help people. It was just baked into the DNA of who we were given who this my parents is what we were. Do. Yeah, this is what we do. It's what we do. And so when did an awareness of money come on the scene? 
Um, I mean, certainly growing up, we were what I would consider to be lower middle class. So we all know, you know, in, in terms of the different waves of economy, there's a lot to be said about whether or not there is a middle class anymore. Lord knows. Um, but I, I would say we were there. And so that meant that we had times when there was some money and then we had plenty of times when there was not. Um, and, and so I had that awareness. I think in terms of the moment when I personally decided to architect a new history or create a new money narrative for myself, um, I would say it's probably in my early 30s, you all. Crazy, right? But true, early 30s. So I would say that very much throughout my 20s, I continue to carry the messages um, that came from both my parents and then all of the ways that society showed up for me, given all of the intersections of my identity. As a woman, as a person of color, right? All those things, y'all. Um, but I would say in my early 30s, where I was like, you know, I, I had gone to, done an international trip. Um, and I had, you know, there were sort of things that were sold to us about how it was going to be. You're going to get paid for this and you're going to get to, you know, and then you get out there and you're like, oh, well, actually that fell through or, oh, well, actually that didn't have. So I came home with much less than what I thought I was going to come home with and rent was due. And the old me, the old, you know, artist, activist, poverty trifecta, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. signing up for me, um, well, you know, I'll just go out and hustle and close the gap. And I was exhausted and I just didn't have it in me and had to really confront that this is the way that I had been living. And, you know, it was a come to, one of the come to Jesus moments, right? Like this is how, and if I wanted something different, I, I had to live differently. I had to create a different conversation that then would spawn different actions when it came to me and my money. So that was, it sounds like a profound pivot point in your early 30s. And I know you shared that you worked in nonprofits. And were there any other pivot points of pain or inspiration that, that stand out to you? You know, it's interesting because I have deep, deep love and respect for the work of nonprofit organizations. Let's let's be clear. They move mountains every single day. And they do it with nothing for many of them. You know, like like it's unbelievable in my mind all of the good that organizations are able to do with such little resources, right? And the pain of that is that we believe, we come to believe because of the way we've been indoctrinated, because of the way in which this particular sector of society organizes itself, because of the way in which our larger society operates, that there is sacrifice, deep, painful sacrifice that is necessary when you make a decision to want to do good in the world. Full body chills as you say that. it's. It's a very strong belief out there. And I've worked in, I think the last nonprofit I worked in was nearby in Oakland, California, working with commercially sexually exploited youth. And the work that people were doing around me and the team that I was on was doing was so important. And we were so motivated and at times so exhausted. Like, can you take on another client, Lisa? No, like, and I can't even rally to do it because the thing that I'm offering that's so intangible of like listening and care and building a relationship with an entirely new human, like I don't have it right now. So, you know, my supervisors are really kind and they would wait a couple of weeks and come back. Can you take them on now? And I'd be like, <laughs> like, I don't know what would give. I think what would give would be the care that person would get. Like I would just be sort of hollow. Like, okay, I can be your case manager, but if you actually want a relationship with me, there's this intangible force that I have an abundance of and I pour into my work and it's it's done right now. So like no is the answer to that question. And I kept coming back to my supervisors like, I, I'm sorry, I just I can't. And eventually they had to put someone on my caseload and that person didn't have the same depth of relationship I had 
with the other people on my caseload because I just didn't have it. I was done. And that was maybe six months before I decided to leave that role because, man, I mean, I realized I could live and die and this is still going to be a problem. And what, how am I going to live my life? What's my angle to try to support, you know, this community and try to use what I've learned and, and leverage it for the benefit of as many people as possible. Yeah, it's it's hard work out there and it's amazing work. And it's powerful, but those moments of of not feeling supported enough, yeah. right? Or not having the resources. Because why were they asking me to take on another client? Because they needed the billable hours because the, the organization needed to keep running. And I don't blame them for that, but that's where you're saying that's the system. I'm saying to right? you that is 100% the system. Yeah. And that that is what is deeply ingrained in the DNA yeah. of so much of the work that we do in the world. And, you know, with the movement of the fourth sector, the conversations of social enterprise and social change, we've started to make some headway in terms of inviting new models, new perspectives, new ways of thinking about building like you can do well and do good. And I will say to you that 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 has to be a conscious, like we got a ways to go in terms of people really in the mainstream feeling like they've got access to those models and the ability to leverage those kinds of opportunities in ways that feel viable and sustainable. Sustainability and viability even is, are, is new language, really, you all, if we want to talk about it in the context of this sector, right? Um, but to your point, the pain, there's, I mean, you know, there's, there's so much pain. I mean, I did one super quick story and, a, and I'm actually going to share this in, in, in different industries because I think it relates to everything that you're saying. I remember when I was running a not-for-profit, I ran it and built a not-for-profit and ran, uh, ran a, that not-for-profit for about seven years as the executive director. And, um, and you know, 90% of your time is spent fundraising. That's just what it means to be an executive director, right? Just is what it is. And I remember we got committed, we got promised by a major foundation a pretty big grant to do a body of work around women in particular and empowering women within a very specific marginalized community. Um, and we ramped up, right? The, assuming we were going to have that money because the last words that the funder said to us was the check's going to be in the mail next week. You know, we're processing, we're at the tail end of processing, it's coming. You all know these conversations, right? Some of you can feel it in your body already about where I'm going, right? It's coming, it's in the mail. And so we, okay, great. We ramped up, we, you know, organized, we got in line, we began conversations because after all, the money was coming. And about four weeks, because you know, you're polite. Let's yeah. tell the truth, you all. Yep. Starving. But you're polite. Right. You're oh, going to wait. Kidding. Exactly. Kidding. You're going to wait before you uh -huh. know. You know uh -huh. what I mean? I remember being in a conversation with someone and talking about the, the, the difference between having privilege and not having privilege is, is being able to wait. Having the capacity to not feel any sense of urgency around whatever the thing is. Right. So, you know, donors could not get back to you two weeks ago and they're, you know, for two weeks and their, their lives are unaffected, right? So, but this, is the, this was the reality, right? But not, not the case for you if you're on the receiving end of that. So four weeks later, I reach out to this funder and this funder is, I'm going to tell the truth, y'all, dodging me, like not returning my calls or committing to talk to me, but then pushing me to the next week at the very last minute. Oh, I had to go into a last minute. Meeting. And finally, I like kind of, I'm, I'm a little surprised at myself, but I did. I kind of rolled up on their assistant and I was like, they need to speak to me today. Like we're in a ser re really serious situation. They need to speak to me today. And the funder got on the phone and said, oh yeah, I know I promised you that grant and there was a situation that went down and I needed to play ball. And in essence, be a good colleague. So I actually leverage the committed money resources to this other initiative. Never bothered to pick up the phone, 
never bothered to communicate, like all, could get that all of that was true. And then their response to me when I was like, jaw on the floor was, well, that's just the cost of doing business. Oh, like my first thought is like, when did you know that? Because, right, if they call you the day after they promise the check or the week after, like there's so much in that waiting period. And like you said, the privilege, some people have the privilege to wait, some people don't. And that urgency, there's, you know, a different kind of wait there, right? That's stressful and that's tension and that that's hard. And so to have that consideration, now, wait, no, it, gets, think... it gets better. Oh, <laughs> if, you oh believe, if you can believe it or not, it gets better. Oh. So through the grapevine, we actually discover who this person was that they wound up rallying around and, and funding. And that person actually wound up coming to us and was like, you know, I just got this big grant. And... I need to figure out how I'm going to do what I told them I was going to do in the proposal. Could you guys help me? Oh, wow. <laughs> and, wow. And, and, how full circle is that? It, I mean, you know what I'm saying? And, and, you know, and it wasn't like, oh, we, I want to pay you. It was oh, like, wait, would you be what? willing to offer your free time? <sighs> no. What? To strategically walk me through how I do this how you were going to do the thing that you were going to get paid for, but now I'm getting paid for it, but I'd like you to do the work for free. Am I following? Similar, right? So very, very close, right? It was a different objective, a different initiative, but the idea was that they were coming for our expertise on the heels of yes. So the world is small when these things occur, right? And so, you know, and, and, but I will say to you all, needless to say that I had decided on that day that this was not the model for me. You become so dependent on those external resources. And I think that is very disempowering over time, especially, right? And it's like, if we're trying to serve people, and I think so many nonprofits have mission statements around empowerment, right? Around healing, around supporting communities, around supporting individuals, around empowerment. And I think it's even more challenging to teach that or lead in that direction when you're not feeling it, right? Because you're also you know, we're all interdependent for sure, but you're, you're leaning so hard on someone else's resources that you don't actually have your own and feel that sense of empowerment. So I've come to understand money over time as like a psychological resource too, right? Like we, we call it financial resource and then, oh, we'll talk about psychological resources. Those are different, but just exactly what you said, then you have the privilege, you have the resources to be able to wait to be able to be selective, to be able to choose what's right for you, to be able to go ahead on that initiative because you have the funding and you have some sense of projections or what's coming in, Not like we ever know 100%, but you have enough of that, like, I have my feet under me. I feel centered. And this is where we're going together rather than, ah, oh, I don't know. I hope it works out. Maybe the check's in the mail. Maybe it's not. Like, that's very disempowering. Yeah, 100%. And I think you know, th there's so many layers to this to this conversation, right? Because I would say to you, psychological resources, cultural resources, emotional resources, spiritual resources, right? Like there's so many elements to this and so much of the psychology, unfortunately, around this work um, comes from the place of lack, comes from the place of deprivation, comes from the place of and, and the thing that, um, because I think the psychological piece that you're naming, Lisa, is so important. The thing that I really want to underscore is the conversation of dignity and how much we as people need dignity. And that when we are deprived of dignity, that's where do you know what I mean? Because somebody can make a mistake. Somebody can disappoint you. Somebody can let you down. Somebody can give you their word and not keep their word. But if there's any sense of remorse, if there's any sense of accountability, you're going to get, okay. Yes, it has real repercussions, but there's still, a, you acknowledge that this has an impact <laughs> versus, 
well. Oh, what? I didn't realize. Yeah, no, yes. whatever. You just move on with your life. I'm moving on with mine. That's sort of dismissive. Or this feeling like you have no autonomy. You have no ability to thrive and exist um, because you're at the mercy of factors that are outside of you. And you've been conditioned to believe this is, you know, this is, we're, we're in a conversation now, traditional power. And the way that the traditional paradigm of power has been set and the way that that table has been set is that you have been indoctrinated to believe that you are at the mercy of all these factors outside of you, which are beyond your control. And if you espouse to a belief that the universe is a dangerous place, that's a dangerous place to be. And so when I took my relationship with money back, and I want to really say it this way, you all. When I took my relationship with money back, when I decided that I was going to create my own narrative, I recognized that I was going to have to forge a new model, a new way of being, a new way of thinking, a new way of living, a new way of operating that allowed me to remain purposeful, but to also have reverence for and recognition for my own capacity and my own sustainability needing to be integral to any kind of purpose I'm trying to deliver or enact in the world. Yeah. It's so powerful. And there's, I want to dig into a little more of what you're saying. And I want to hear about your, I think I would call it a transformation around your relationship with money. Is that fair? Or like, yeah. It, oh, absolutely. Complete, completely different between what you described in your 20s to now and and before we go there i'm just curious if on this nonprofit piece do you have i'm like hoping <laughs> do you have a vision of and do you see people doing things in a way that feels like ah oh, that's it like this is the direction this can go uh, cuz i really struggled with that in the nonprofit world you know when you're you're young and you're in a you know career development you're kind of like do i want to go here do i want to go there and i was just looking for it within that world and i was like i don't want to be the executive director of fundraising i don't want to be the program director managing hundreds of cases for interns like i just didn't see that future there and so in terms of how they're functioning in terms of their role within society what do you see happening that's good I would say that, you know, I come back to this conversation of new models, new ways of being, new ways of operating. And I would say that entrepreneurial leaders who sit in not-for-profit seats um, are, are really, I think, the greatest hope we have of transforming, right? You know, and I would say, you know, because all nonprofits are not created equal, this is very, very true. I would also say that there are people who sit in non for profit seats who've done management courses, who have MBAs, who've gone to graduate schools, who have different tools and skills, or who have different kinds of Rolodexes. I mean, you know, this is really like, again, this is a, this is a nuanced question um, with a big answer, depending upon where you fall. But what I will say is that I do believe that in the world of social enterprise and social venture, that I think there are more entrepreneurial based solutions that are wanting to be born and more um, change agents who are really stepping inside of entrepreneurial kinds of approaches um, that are enabling and inviting a new chapter of viability and sustainability for the work. Mm -hmm. I love that it comes back to the viability and sustainability. I think those are great, like grounding words uh, for those of us or folks who are feeling that that transition and looking for like, what's the flame? What's the light at the at the end of the tunnel or whatever you know metaphor you want to use? Like, where am I going? <laughs> what what's yeah. the goal? Uh, yeah, I I appreciate everything you're saying there. I, I'm thinking of a. I used to work for another nonprofit that taught yoga in juvenile halls called the art of yoga project and we went to this film screening i don't remember how it was related to the organization maybe someone on the board was involved with it or something but at the end of the film they had um in the credits 
a list of like all the nonprofits that the film was connected to and all the organizations that were doing this work and that work and supporting this community and that community. And it just was going on for like, it felt like hours. I'm sure it was like, I don't know, 15 minutes or something. It was a long time when you're sitting there watching credits. And that really impacted me at the time because I thought, wow, look, like we're not alone, right? And you know that, but I'm not like going into Google and scrolling and just looking at names of nonprofits. But now when I look back at it, I think, and this sort of, I don't know, maybe a few years after started bubbling up within me of like how disconnected all of that is, Mm -hmm. right? Like there's all these people and all these different groups all over the world doing all this stuff. So one of the words that comes to my mind as you're talking to is like integration. Like how do we build as social entrepreneurs or if there's a social venture, like where is the let's not reinvent the wheel? Where is the interdependence? Where is the... Like think of, I don't know, a a lot of things that just feel like they have more of a centrality in in their force, if that makes sense. Like there's more power because there's more interconnection. And so that's something I see happening on the smaller scale. Like we were a nonprofit in Oakland, the other one I was talking about before, and we partnered with other nonprofits and that's not uncommon. But when you look at it on a really large scale, it's hard because again, there's not necessarily the resources or the time or the the privilege to step back and go, hmm, let me just see who else is doing this and connect with them. Well, yeah, it's it's I think to also understand that that like there that's a body of work to connect a field, to build a field, to support and provide infrastructure. And and it, I I would also say, Lisa, that one of the reasons why these kind of hybrid models and more innovative sort of approaches to doing the work are emerging is because so much of what has been the experience often in traditional um, nonprofits is that you get lots of money for program and very little for capacity building. So you get trained to not build infrastructure. You get rewarded, actually. That's, that's another real way to say it. You get rewarded for not building infrastructure. So you chase program because that's where the dollars are. And then when it starts, when you start to look at, well, how much of philanthropic dollars is actually dedicated to capacity building, capacity building within the organization itself or capacity building within the field, you would be, you know what I'm saying? Like you're you're talking maybe 80-20, maybe. You understand what I'm saying? Maybe it's, so what it says to you is that when you get grant money, every single dollar is supposed to go out the door. You're not supposed to eat. You're not. But the truth of the matter is if you don't eat, none of it's possible. So, you know, there are there's structural ways of being and operating that are rooted in something much bigger that is not about having this work thrive, dare I say, but I'm going to say it. I mean, I I feel like if there weren't, wouldn't it be different, right? Like there's something, you know, there's this sense sometimes of this like invisible barrier that some someone or something's coming up against. I mean, for myself as a therapist, sometimes you're just like, I feel like we keep hitting our head against this wall and there's something there, but I don't know what it is. So that's kind of the same feeling I get here is, it's not for lack of want, right? I've known so many people in these leadership roles and nonprofits, like they're thinking about how can we be more effective? They're thinking about strategy, but they, to your point, don't have the funding to do that. And so there are structures that are enabling that to say it nicely, (laughs) right? Yeah. 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 And I think the, you know, what I would say if you are a not-for-profit leader listening or part of an organization where you know that hustle, you know that hand to mouth hustle really, really well. And you know that you're doing God's work. Let's just put it, let's just call it what it is, right? Or or Jehovah or whoever, you know what I mean? Or source or spirit or the work of love. Or goddess. However, <laughs> come on, right? However you want to describe it, exactly. Um, you know, you know that you are an extension of source, energy, doing the work in the world, um, that that being really intentional about your model is more imperative than it's ever been, especially as we're re-architecting 
and reimagining the world of work right now um, and what it means to do work that is meaningful and that matters in the world. Yeah. So there's some opportunity in the impacts of the pandemic and the shifts that are happening and the things being thrown up in the air still at this point for us to continue to reimagine, like, what does this look like moving forward? Yeah. And to, uh, you know, because I know at the center of this conversation is really about money, is to take back our relationship, redefine our relationship with source. Because resource is an extension of source. Yes. Yes. Oh my God, quote that, write it down, tweet it, <laughs> all of it. <laughs> you probably have. You're like, I've been doing that for lots of years now. Mm -hmm. But we got to repeat these things to really get them in ourselves, right? It doesn't happen quickly. It's not, I mean, we take on a mantra and then we got to live it for a while uh, for it to start to shift. So what's your relationship with money like today? How would you describe that? I see money as a facilitator like a grand facilitator of opportunity and of purpose, you know? And I think um, because of so much of what we've seen in the world has been the way in which money has harmed, has caused harm in the world or the way that money has been corrupted or the way that people have been corrupted by money, which, you know, get to those six requests, here it is. Um, but I see money as a grand facilitator for me of vision and of resource. And my intention in life is to be well-resourced in all that I do. And some of that looks like money, and there are other currencies that fall into that. But but being well resourced mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, right? I, was like, I don't think you're talking about Bitcoin. I think <laughs> no, you're no, talking no, about no. other things, you know? <laughs> you know, because who knows what it's going to be tomorrow, right? Um, you know, so I I think this um, for me the that money operates in service of my vision, that money lives as an expression of my love for myself and for others. And I think that love for myself piece may be one of the hardest, Lisa, right? If we think about where we're coming from in this conversation of the nonprofits, right? Um, because so many of us don't feel we're worthy or capable or able. Um, or that it's available for everybody else, but it's not available for us. You know, there's a lot we carry that stands in the way of our ability to be well resourced. You're making me think of a couple of clients over the years that have had expressed this thought or feeling like, maybe if something really bad happens to me, then I can rest. Or maybe if I fall off my bike on the way to work, then people will show up for me. Like to get to that point. And that is like when you're talking about the self-love piece and the receiving end of, you know, being a part of this flow, I'm, I'm giving support, but I'm also receiving it. I'm also well-resourced. Like those are moments and, and people experiencing these moments of really like desperation, right? I have a need. I have a need for people to gather around my bed and tell me that they love me or send cards or flowers or something or I have a need to stop and like not go to work for a day or a week. And those are, you know, those moments of the lack of the sustainability or the the lack of the the resource that you're describing and that love really, like that self, you know, you said so many things in there of of the money being something that flows to you flows through you right you're you're giving it you're receiving it and that i always think of like the infinity symbol or right, there's yeah. something really beautiful happening there and in those other examples it's out of balance it's out of whack right something's off yeah and i want to say that as much as we've been in the conversation of the not-for-profit this is everywhere 
Yeah, one of those people was actually working for a very uh, successful corporation that yeah. I'm thinking of. Yeah, I was going to say, this is everywhere, yeah. right? Yeah. Because we've inherited the same kind of um, conditioning as to why we go make money, why we are in environments where we're not seen or heard or respected, where we are expected to work 150 hours, right, to, to take on three jobs, you know, to um, not regard our health or our families or, you know, and I think one of the, <clears throat> the great things that, <clears throat> what I call the sacred pause, what many of us call, right, the pandemic, one of the things that um, it gave us a reset on was the opportunity to see the degree to which we had put our work, our jobs above everything. If you're into this podcast, I've got more goodies for you. My audiobook, Yoga for Trauma Recovery Theory, Philosophy, and Practice, just came out on Audible. You can search for my name or for Yoga for Trauma Recovery on the Audible app or site, and you'll be able to download the free intro there. I'm also offering the first ever live summer training intensive in Yoga for Trauma Recovery this summer. Why for Tea Live is for wellness professionals and people seeking to facilitate healing through embodied practices. We'll be able to connect, discuss, reflect in real time, and practice yoga together for six sessions over three weeks this summer. I'm super excited about this, and I'd love to invite you to join. You can get all the info at howwecanheal.com backslash live. That's howwecanheal.com backslash live. So let's talk about the six root causes. So this is in the course, Making Money, Making Change. I earmarked it. I bookmarked it. I probably played it. I'm not even kidding. Chapter 12. I probably played it 12 times. Like again, again. And just like making, I was like, mm, as I was listening, I was like, literally, like I was eating a really good sandwich or something. I was like yeah. in it. Well, you know. So what are the what are they? What are what are those causes, right? And, and I just have to say, you articulate like the ability to articulate them, like, ah, oh, okay. So you have there's not enough. Yeah. I'm not worthy. Yes. I'm afraid of what it's gonna take. Yes. That goes back to the 150 hour work week. Well, I'm not signing up for that. I will be changed. I'll become someone I don't like. And I've got issues with capitalism, something I want to talk about in there. And then I am not safe. So can you start to break those down for us? And like, how did, well, first, how did you even get, this is through your work that yes. you, your own personal work that you came to these. Yes. Thank you for articulating them. Cause again, I just have to say, it's so refreshing to hear it. Sometimes things you're processing in the background of your mind or in your life or with your friends, and then to hear it articulated in a really um, clear way is just very refreshing. So break it down for us. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank, thank you for saying that. And, and yeah, it, it's my, it was my own journey and it was what I've observed over 30 years of being on the front lines of human experience, you know, in terms of what people bump up against over and over and over. I kept seeing this. And so the uh, there is not enough has everything to do with the scarcity conditioning that operates at the heartbeat of our society, our global society. And we know this, right? We're, there's so many places where we're taught that there's not enough. That, you know, some people are going to get and some people aren't going to get, you know, and your job is to try to make sure that you're the one that gets or your job is to try to learn how to do without. Right. These are these are the sort of the central messages. Right. Um, but this there is not enoughness shows up around everything. Time money, love, appreciation, recognition. You know, we can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, but this whole idea that no matter what we're addressing or what we're engaging, that it's in um, short supply. And that underneath it, what it means is that, is that I will do without. I will have to do without because there is not enough, right? And that in my mind, not that I want to, and we could skip ahead and not go through them in order, but 
it makes me think of I, I'm not safe, right? Because there's this urgency, there's this fear, there's something underneath that's like there's not enough, and so I'm not going to be okay. Yeah. Right. So yeah. It, I mean, they they can tie in and overlap for sure. The other one, I think, or the second one connects to what we've been talking about in terms of that self love piece, in terms of I am not worthy, or I don't deserve this, or other people get this first before I do. How do you see that one showing up? Yeah, I think there are ways in which we shun opportunity, we shun support, we step around help. And this is one I see every single day in conversations where our, and, and, and I want to speak specifically about our willingness to invest in ourselves. It's one of the biggest places where we feel no permission you know, there was a study um, done by a professor, I believe, based out of Cornell, um, where she looked at the differences between men having disposable income and what they did with it versus women having disposable income and what they did with it. And for women, particularly for women who were in families, married with children, when men got extra money, it was their money. When women got any semblance of extra money, it was the family's money. And often it went to the family and very rarely did it come to them. And, and the sort of the findings of their report, the sort of bottom line findings of the report was that women are um, not prone to invest in themselves, not prone to put themselves first when it comes to resourcing, right? And being resourced. And I would add people of color, like I would, th you know, we could go, there are a lot of different, you know, if we look at class, we, there are a lot of different you all um, places where we could enter into this conversation and would find the correlation, right? The similarities. Um, and certainly if you have more than one of these intersecting identities, it's exacerbated this this question of worthiness, um, and whether or not um, you deserve to have better. And I think with that about just what's reflected to us, what we grow up seeing, everything we take in with our all of our senses through our eyes, like all the messages we get there in terms of belonging, like where do I belong, and what's me and what's not me, and those kind of developmental tasks that you know we do sort of figure out a template at some point in our in our brains and then we go wait what's that doing in there and where did that come from and so that's where i feel like the the real personal work like like you've done and you support other people in doing is is a big part of making larger change right because it's internalized a lot of this and and, and that carries it forward just as much as as, I mean, maybe even more, <laughs> but it, you know, once things are internalized, it's it's in there, and we've got to do the work to to see it, to work with it, to um, to name it, and then to to move forward, hopefully in a a clearer way to cleanse cleanse yeah. some of that. Yeah, and I think that to, to know that you know these show up uh, when you're succeeding, because I think people feel like oh fail, you know, when I'm failing, this is all of what's going on with me, right? But they show up equally. And dare I even say, maybe in some cases, even more intensified when you are succeeding. Because they're the the little invisible barrier that you're coming up against. So, so when you're, you can hear them, maybe when you feel like you're whatever not succeeding is, but then once you really come up against that barrier, that boundary, that message internally, it gets louder, right? You're right up next to it. Who do you think you are? And all those things. All those things. Yeah. And we, you know, we find ways to, you know, miss the appointment or drop the ball or not follow up or follow through or find, you know, other justifications for why we don't step into the opportunities. And, um, and those are all at a core level, often the, the message of I'm not worthy that's operating. So what about I'm afraid of what it's gonna take? This was a big one for me um, as well. I think we have been sold a mythology about success that, you know, 
hard work and sacrifice, hard work and sacrifice all the time, 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 all the time. And only a few of us are going to make it. So if you want to make it, you better be prepared to just work all the time. You better be prepared to do, you know, so there's that piece of it. The other strand of it is um, this idea of making it and maintaining it. And what is it going to require of me to maintain it once I get it? Like, okay, I can get there, but can I maintain it? And this is that conversation about, you know, am I willing to work 18 hours a day? Am I willing to never see my kids? Am I willing to? Um, so this is about the trade and what, we're, what we have been taught we have to trade in order to be successful. And some of the most important things, family, time with your family, like what do people say on their deathbed, right? Like who, who, who do people want? <laughs> yes, work that you love, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think there's, um, there's a real reckoning that goes on when we look at, you know, what we've been indoctrinated to believe is necessary. You know, now the studies and the science are coming out like the truth is you're only really good for about four hours a day. <laughs> yeah. In like 90 minute chunks. You know what tops. I'm saying, right? Now, and, and, right? And then if you really, if you're really going to high performance, it's 45, you know, so, yeah. right? And then you need to run around for 10 minutes. So, you know what I'm saying? So, but, but the, the, I think these old schools of thought, these old paradigms and ways of operating and being and the ways in which we've been indoctrinated to push and force, um, this, what it's going to take, and, and, and that at the heart of the conversation, because hard work is one, but at the heart of the conversation is this question of who I am and what I think is going to be required of me. And do I feel like I have it in me to do what I think is going to be required of me? You were talking about force, and I think about you know yoga, having been a yoga teacher for so long, and like what happens when we force things? something breaks, we injure ourselves, right? I know teachers who have been demonstrating something and injured themselves because they were like, come on body, just do it, right? <laughs> Instead of listening and attuning and, and knowing our needs. So it's like that level of energy, there's always a cost, like there's a cost at a certain point. And I don't know that we know that as a collective, like we just push and push and push and think this is the way, this is the way and, and there's harm a lot of the time in that too. Yeah. And I think, again, this is the relearning. This is the inviting in new messages and new perspectives because we don't only get it personally, but we get it societally. There are things that get modeled in our culture that tell us that this is what we should be, quote unquote, doing. Um, and so, you know, I think the I'm afraid of what it's going to take has a lot to do with that. Yeah. And then what about I will be changed? Yeah, this is the, the, the concern of being corrupted and the concern of being perceived as being corrupted, that somehow success is defined as compromising oneself. And again, we've got a lot of anecdotal experience if we look at right the narratives around success and getting to the top and what it means and how people supposedly change and i remember being in a very profound and intimate conversation with someone really really um accomplished and well known in the world and they said to me that you know when you succeed you don't change the people around you change but they see you different <laughs> you know, and I thought that that was fascinating, right? You know, this idea that, you know, that they are still the same person, but there's all this perception that gets heaped on them about who they must be now and how this is the sellout conversation you all, right? You sold your soul or, you know, or you abandoned your people or it's all those things. And those are very real and deep conversations for people. And this abandoning your people. This is also part of what's, I'm afraid of what it might take. So we the hard work, but also that you can't hang around the people that you used to hang around with, or you can't be a part of 
right? Because after all, if you really want to be successful, this is really where you need to be. And the corrupted part is that your values get compromised or that you'll be perceived as having had your values compromised. Um, and for people who feel deeply identified, which is most of us, with our values, that's a non-starter. And I'm just thinking of how that prevents access to resources, right? We're talking about this as, as resource, as support, as facilitating possibility. And it's like, well, I don't want to be changed. I don't want to step away from my group. I don't want to be seen as different. So I'll stay here where maybe there's less possibility. There's less freedom. There's less choice. Because, I mean, I think about you know, being ostracized or not belonging is such a huge fear for so many good reasons, right? And so how easy that could keep not just one of us, but a whole group of us, if we're kind of agreeing to these same norms and values, could just keep us from having what yeah. we need. Right? When I got- Or having more support. 100%. When I got to the heart of that conversation for myself, what I realized was that I, because of that conversation, did not believe that I could trust myself with more. I did not believe that I could trust myself with more. That was a very humbling moment for me, a really life-changing moment when I was like, well, what is it that I believe about myself that I think that I can't be trusted with more? That'll shake you right there. <laughs> And it takes a while to dig deep enough to find that one, right? That's like hid and under a lot of these other things that are really easy to sort of dust off or justify or, you know, see in, in a helpful light. But you got to dig for that one. Yeah, because you think that that one's about everybody else. Like, oh, they're right. They're yeah. they're corrupt or they're you know what I mean. But the but really what we're saying underneath that is I'm afraid that I'm going to be corrupt. So I better not touch that or I better not lean into that or I better not embrace that and I'll become that thing I fear I'll or judge that or thing see I fear in the world. I judge or see hundred percent. So that leads us nicely into I've got issues with capitalism. And I heard this one and I was like, oh I don't know. And then you you know it, you went on with it. I mean, yeah. I was like, I wouldn't put it that way. And then this is what you said. I want to serve a population or community that cannot afford me but really needs what I have to offer and I can't afford to give it to them for free. And I was like, oh, oh my God, that one, <laughs> like right in the heart. And then the next part you said was, so I'm angry at capitalism. And so I was like, I wouldn't have like, before you know, cracking this course said, I'm angry at capitalism. Like, yeah, I'm not super happy with it, but it's not something I personally like harp on just because there's so many things in my brain and so many places to go. So I wouldn't have expressed it that way. But when you said, and I'll say it again, I want to serve a population or community that cannot afford me, but really needs what I have to offer and I can't afford to give it to them for free. I was like, oh, you just labeled my struggle bus <laughs> like, yeah. of the last, I don't know, of like, like a, that's like a 10 year struggle bus I feel like I was on. And still, like listening to it, I was like, oh, yes, like wouldn't it, the, the amount of times I thought, what if I could just make a really good living and keep doing this nonprofit work and keep doing exactly what I'm doing, keep showing up in juvenile halls, keep showing up in communities that that don't have the resources to pay me directly. Wouldn't that be nice? So talk about this one. Tell us how this came up for you and, and where you I mean, I think it. this is the activist anthem, quite frankly. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think um, I think so much of when we go to do good in the world, we are wanting to serve the least resourced, right? And the most, um, as we perceive, those who really need the work the most and they're not well resourced. And we're not in a position where we're resourced enough to be able to not have to worry about it, right? And this is, this is the bridge that we hope that philanthropy helps us close, but we all know that those gaps are large for lots and lots of reasons. And it has nothing to do with there not being enough. That's been proven false, right? Um, 
but I do want to say that 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 um, coming to grips with that, that especially the second part of it, because we kind of like, okay, there are people who need my work, but they can't afford it. What really is the rub is I can't afford to do it for free. Right. I can't afford to do it. so. Right. So now that puts me in a situation where I'm there's this tension between what I really want to be doing, what I believe I should be doing, what I believe I'm called to be doing and what I'm actually able to do, given my capacity. And a little bit of victimization in there for me personally of like, that's so unfair. Right. That's the anger. You said, so I'm angry at capitalism. Like, that's so unfair because other people have passions that they can be sustained by, right? And so I feel like I have to name that because it's like a real sticky undercurrent to, to I think, getting stuck yes. in this one. Yeah, and and the perception that every, this is back to the, like, everybody else can, but not me. It's possible for them, but it's not possible for me, you know? Um, and I think to your point, um, because when we do the frontline work, what we see is such a breakdown and, and, and I'm being, you know, I'm trying to find the words you all hear because breakdown is a really, really gentle way to say what we experience is a real um, faltering of our social fabric, a real rip or shredding of our social fabric when we look at the conditions that some people have to live in and operate in um, and right beside them, see other people having every, you know, somebody throwing out a steak dinner and somebody, <laughs> you know, who wishes they had, you know, do you, do you understand what I'm saying, right? Or even a quarter of a hamburger to throw away. And so uh, when you see that kind of disparity side by side, right, it becomes very difficult to, um, to not feel some kind of way, right, about our current system. And so you know, my challenge with that one was I, I realized that being an anti-capitalist was not a vision. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part, right? So being anti anything, you all, I'm just saying, it's not a vision. I, I, I had to be willing to come up with what is a viable alternative for me. And it's so important to think about what is the vision, you know, in, in Oakland nearby here, there have been stores that put up these stickers that say, we're united against hate. And I'm like, that's good. What are you united for? <laughs> like, can you, can you put that sticker up at least as well? <laughs> like, can, can we put them side by side? So are you united for love, for acceptance, for equality? What is it? But can we express that as well at, at minimum? Right. Because I do feel like we can get really pulled into a push pull and a, a fight that doesn't really go anywhere if we don't have some sense of what it is we actually want or what would yeah. feel good. The challenge with that statement, and we talk about this a lot when entrepreneurs come into our work and with the crowd, the challenge with that statement is that hatred still has to exist in order for that statement to be viable. And so we create the self-fulfilling prophecy of what we say we don't want, right? We, because we've embedded it in our vision. The word is right next to the door handle. I'm going into the used bookstore and opening the door and I'm seeing hatred, right? I mean, I think a lot about language and words and what, what we choose and what we say to ourselves and other people. And so that, that stands out to me because it's like, how does it feel when we just read and intake a word or hear a word? What, how does that resonate in our bodies? What does it perpetuate yeah. even to take it further? In my book, The Calling, I go even deeper. You know, I touch it in making money, making change. And then in, in The Calling, I go even deeper around this idea of personal economy. You know, that we have an opportunity to really be guided by our values when we start to look at the way in which we want to operate in terms of how we earn, how we save, how we invest how we spend, um, and that, that each of us on an individual level can begin to take our power back when we start to go, okay, well, how do I want to make my money? In what ways feel really honorable for me and how I want to show up, right? Well, how do I want to spend my money? I remember 
the shift that I had, and again, I talk about this in the calling, the shift that I had that really enabled me to actively and intentionally be willing to make a lot of money came from the idea that I could actually transform economy. Because, and, 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 and I, you know, Lisa, I would, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I would imagine like making a whole lot of money for the sake of making a whole lot of money, most people don't get so excited about that. You know, when I think about, especially when I think about people who have a deep passion for wanting to make a difference in the world and really, really wanting to help people. Like you're not, you're not looking to stack money for money's sake. You know what I mean, right? And so, you know, I, I say that because I used to go to those trainings and, you know, they would want to get you really amped up about making a whole bunch of money. And I'm just like, yeah, I mean, I get it. I do get it. I do get it. I swear, y'all. But it's never going to be something that's going to drive me, given who my parents were and given what I come from and given what I've seen. But this idea of reimagining economy in a way where more people can thrive and prosper Oh, I'm excited about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to make a way for that. I'm willing to be resourced in the name of that. Um, and this is what I mean when I say our opportunity to have a vision is what enables us to shift or transform um, those challenges we have with capitalism. It makes me think of uh, actually a nonprofit that's in Kenya in Nairobi. Uh, Africa Yoga Project I, I worked with, volunteered with for some time, and they have a model of, you know, obviously they're fundraising and all of that, but they train their, their they offer yoga classes and then they train yoga teachers who then can go out and, you know, have a, a, a well-paying job in the community offering yoga. And so these things that have, like, I feel like that's a little piece of what you're describing here. Like, where is there a true sense of empowerment and of systemic change and uh, like I feel it like a like a shift that clicks right and you're like ah oh, there it is that feels so much better and you go from yeah. you know in this personal economy conversation there's there's so much to unpack but you go from being mad about spending your money to being excited you yeah. know what I mean because yes. you're like Ooh, I want to put it there <laughs> right yeah like, oh wow I get to invest in this corner bakery that's like the third generation and you know what I mean? And they're bringing these ancient recipes from their corner of the world. And, you know, they're up four o'clock every morning, rolling the dough fret. Like, yes, take all my money. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Me, right. And I think it's like, if, wow, mm -hmm. if we could think about, and it's so beautiful because I know in the Oakland community, that that's so much of, of part of the ethos, right? Uh, of what I've experienced, when we think about people's grocery, shout out people's grocery, or some of the other <clears throat> communities and, and ventures that have been built in those communities. And so this idea of like, wow, every time I spend my dollar, could I be thankful? Could I be inspired? Could I be fired up? I love supporting new entrepreneurs. I love giving them business, you know, um, and, and our opportunity to see that and, 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 and again, embrace the power that can be associated with moving our dollars in alignment with our values. And that's such a moment of connection, right? I'm giving this, you know, whatever it is, $10 for bread to a person that I value and I care about and I want to invest in you know what, like the bread fell on the floor, let me buy another one because I don't want you yes. to be out, yes. right? Yes. Like that kind of level of, of interpersonal connection. And, and, and again, like coming back to that image of webbing, right? Of like, we are connected and, and we value each other and, and the feeling of that versus some of the other things we've felt. And that leads nicely. I want to make sure we don't forget the last one, even though I mentioned it earlier, if I'm not safe, right? Because I feel like when we have those connections, we inherently feel safer. It's kind of like if you're in, I don't know, say you're like in a rental, you're in a new place or traveling and, and if the house is empty and it's like really big, it feels weird, right? You feel like less safe. Whereas if there's people you know, or there's, you know, a family feel like it just inherently feels like you can settle in a little yeah. bit more. The sense of connection. The I am not safe uh, root cause here that I really point to is, is rooted in trauma, where 
for many of us having attention at a very young age wound up being a very negative experience. And certainly we live in a society that has a very well established habit of building people up and then ripping them down, you know, or people get something and then they become prone to attack. And so people don't aspire, people don't reach because they're concerned that if they do, then that they'll be preyed upon in a very particular way. I remember having a conversation. I used to host these community meditations. And I remember a woman, we did one on money one time. And I remember a woman came up to me and she said, you know, I want to aspire to more. But I know that the minute it looks like I'm progressing, my family is going to be all over me about why I'm not supporting them and why I'm not. And it can be exhausting. And so because I don't want that pressure or I don't want to feel that guilt or that sense of obligation, um, I, don't, I don't reach. I don't push. And that, that's a, you know, a translation of it's not safe. It's not okay. Somebody's going to be upset if I succeed. And therefore, let me, let me not. Right. Right. Let me not. Well. I mean, Martin Luther King. I mean, this is what we're talking about, right? Mahatma Gandhi, this is what we're talking about, right? That you become prey in that way. And so we have to work through that for, for those of us who have this persecution, this fear of persecution um, that shows up really deeply for us, like places and spaces to be able to really work through that. And when you give those examples, it, it illustrates how you know real that experiential trauma is right like seeing that happen i went with uh an ex of mine my um boyfriend in in grad school to where martin luther king was buried and he was a social worker and he was just crying the whole time you know and i think this is a lot of it of like that how can this happen to someone who's who's doing something so powerful and this is what i want to do and how can I do it? Like, how, how could I ever, right? So yeah, that safety is big. And I think it is really rooted in trauma. So thank you for naming that. You know, I wanted to talk a little bit about your, uh, your TED Talk, but I don't know if we have time. And I want to make sure you can finish the thought you were just having too. So go ahead with that. No, just that I think that the safety piece, that this idea of how do we begin to develop a sense of safety inside of ourselves as part of the work, you know, and again, like I go deep on these six pieces in, in, in the, the work that I do with leaders in various configurations and constellations, but I do want to speak to the safety piece because I think so many people, especially coming out of the last two years, Lisa, right? Heck, if we look at just, you know, in the, at the time of this taping, you know, we look at, we just came out of a weekend of two instances of mass shootings, right, um, rooted in identity. Um, and I think that this idea of how we start to cultivate a sense of safety and a sense of belonging within ourselves is part of the next frontier in terms of the work that we're here to do, you know, and, and the degree to which we can start to build that capacity within ourselves in terms of doing that healing work. Um, is a degree to which we grow that capacity to be able to create that and be that for others. So this is kind of where we are right now. Do you want to say, I don't want to be quick with your TED Talk because it's such a rich topic. I mean, we'd love to have you back on if you want to just come back on anytime, open invitation. Um, but you want to just, at least for folks that are listening, um, speak to the topic a little bit. So you're talking about redefining power at work to include women of color. And I believe it's Deepa Parashathaman. Parashathaman. Rishatham and my beloved partner, shout out Deepa. Um, yeah, what I would say is that, you know, we've, we've been, again, talking sort of in the, in the context of not-for-profit. We've been talking in sort of the context of being a change agent and sort of navigating that space. But I would also say that we know that this operates in corporations. We know that this operates in our society. And I think our society is relooking in a new way and renegotiating in a very, very new way and, and asking itself in very real time, 
what should the the vision, the future of work look like? That's not just about technology, but it's about how we as people at the very core rehumanize and how we learn how to work together, how to see one another, how to be together, how to work together. And so this TED Talk is really rooted in the experiences, understanding the experiences of women of color, which in some cases are quite unique to maybe what others are experiencing in the workplace. But it comes back to the same conversations that we've been engaged in today, which is really about how do we create systems, structures, paradigms, communities, ecosystems, where every single one of us can show up as our full selves and thrive and prosper, where there can be love and dignity and respect and appreciation and valuing of who we are and what we bring. And I think that that's at the core of the work. And what I want you all to know is, is like that's our work with us and us because we've inherited a lot of stuff that does not belong to us about who we are and who we're not, about what we're capable of and what we're not capable of. And so the most sacred and holy work that we can do is with us and us, because that is the primary relationship that we are having with us and us. And as we build and learn how to grow and nurture and care for ourselves, we have more capacity to then be able to do that out in the world. Absolutely. You know, I was going to ask what advice you would have for women of color or I don't know, it might be a different angle for non-binary folks, but if, if they want to step into roles of power, like, yeah, I think it's, I think it's really recognizing what your vision is, you know, because I think regardless of orientation, a lot of people put their hands on power and they're not clear. They're not clear about what they're being driven by or guided by. And this is actually the next book that's coming, Lisa. Yes, yes, <laughs> so come I'm, back. I'm We're yes, talking about yes, next book. We'll get there, but I'm, yes. I'm just literally, you all just, just starting to pretend to pay for on the second book now. <laughs> but it's all about ambition. And it's all about being able to understand what we get driven by. And in what ways are we operating from wounded ambition versus true ambition? And how do we make those distinctions and how do we understand that? And so um, that is our work because if we want to lead, if we do want to truly make the world better, we do have to be operating in service of a vision. And we have to be willing to do the inner work. You know, the sort of, uh, I love the work of William Urey and we, We've had the privilege, William is one of my homies, and we've had the honor and the privilege of working with him and supporting his leadership, but also um, having him in our space and in our community and talking to our folks. And uh, he talks about the work of the three sides, and there's the inner work, then there's the interpersonal work, then there's the communal work. And his observation of these three sides actually came from being in, I believe it was Mozambique, and watching a tribe resolve its conflicts and actually being able to extrapolate the process of watching the way they resolve conflicts for going, oh, wow, there's three sides. There's your personal work that you need to do. You need to, he says, go to the balcony is the way he describes it, right? And then there's the interpersonal work that needs to happen. Like in other words, the two people who are in the conflict, but then there's the community that's been impacted by the conflict. And how does the community realign itself in support of the resolution? Right. And we think of it now in, in the context of the work that we're doing is we're saying it's the inner work, it's the interpersonal work, right, which is the work of culture. And then it's the structural work, the systemic work. And how do we go to work on the ecosystems that have these kinds of disparities baked in? I love the vision that you you're describing too in all of that. Uh, like it, a lot of what you've just said, it's like it gives you somewhere to go, right? It gives you, you know, there, there's a there's a light there at the end of the tunnel. So, so two women of color and our binary folks and other folks just who are listening, like you know, this is your time. This is your time. We're in an incredible moment where I think Lisa, more of us are being asked to influence the reshaping and the reimagining of our world, of our future, of where we're going, whether you're doing that as a healer, 
and you're bringing yoga into corporations or whether you're stepping into other kinds of institutions and circles and you're carrying your gifts. And what I want to say to you is that our internal healing work, our preparatory work, our realigning with purpose and calling, our clarity of vision and desired impact, that that work is just as important as anything else we may have done externally to get the opportunity. And we want to be really clear when we take our seats, what will be different? So I always like to wrap up by asking what gives you hope? I think this moment for me, I think you give me hope. All of the people who are listening to this conversation give me hope because I believe that we're all sifting and sorting right now, trying to get to our own truths about what we're going to you know, allow and tolerate and have and not have, and whether that's the two hour each way commute or whether that's flexible time so we can love up on our babies while we get our work done or, you know, all of the things that I feel like we're standing for right now, you know, post this great resignation is what gives me hope because we have the opportunity if we stay awake at the wheel to really re-architect and reimagine how this is done. Our watch, y'all. This is our watch, our time. I love it. And I know you're putting pen to paper and you're continuing to just flow things through. I have to say, I feel so much depth in what you're saying. There's, I can really feel that you've done so much internal digging and deep work. And then the clarity that comes with being able to articulate that. I just have a lot of appreciation for that. So thank you so much. And I feel the love that's pouring through this. And I think it's so important to have these conversations around how does that relate to money? How does how do we build healthier, healthy economies, right? And more inclusive and, and dignified interactions and more, you know, true interconnection and true moments of valuing each other. So thank you. How can people connect with you, read your books? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, just for the space that you create and for the people that you impact. It's been my joy to be here. And then in terms of how people can find me, so on social at Raw Goddess, and it's R-H-A, Goddess. And then also, um, you know, I, I have to always come bearing gifts. And so we do want to share the, the resources of The Calling, which is the book, Three Fundamental Shifts to Stay True, Get Paid, Do Good. And you can get it on all of the major platforms. Shout out St. Martin's Press. Um, but also, uh, we're going to share a link to our resources page where you, those are free. You can come in and just, you know, input your name, your email, you'll get all access to all of the tools and the tips and the worksheets. Because again, Lisa, to your point, how do we make this concrete? How do we make this real? And then the making money, making change, which is part of my collaboration with Sounds True. Shout out the Sounds True family. Um, and that you can get on Audible as well as the calling on Audible if you prefer it in Audible format. Um, but those are all uh, available to you. I love some audiobooks, and I've said this earlier. I don't think we were recording yet, but I love that you laugh in making money, making change. And I just like there's just moments where you're laughing at yourself, you're laughing with the commentary, you just go, and I'm like, man, like I just recorded my audiobook, and I was like, why didn't I laugh in there? Like, what? Am I, like, come on, it's just so it's such a different experience to have that. So. Yeah, thank you for that. And I encourage people to, you know, follow you and listen to what you're saying and absorb the love and share the love and just keep it going. Because I know you said your name is a very powerful, you know, representation for you and you try to live up to it. But I'm like, Psh, try. <laughs> you do it. <laughs> like, you are living up to that. So thank, so thank you, you so much, truly, Lisa, for having me and for all this incredible work that you do. And congratulations on your new book. Have to say that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Audiobook, literally up, uploading it to Audible, like as we, yeah, yet last time. Cannot night. wait, cannot <laughs> wait to dig in. Yes. Mm. Thank you so much, Ra, and I do hope we can have Be you back. Be my pleasure. Thank you again. Thanks so much for listening. My hope is that you walk away from these episodes feeling supported and like you have a place to come to find the hope and inspiration you need to take your next small step forward. For more information and resources, please visit HowWeCanHeal.com. There, you'll find tons of helpful resources and the full transcript of each show. 
Thanks so much for your messages, feedback, and ideas about the podcast. I love hearing from you and I so appreciate your support. There are lots of ways you can support the show and I'm grateful for every little bit of love you share. If you love the show, please leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, Audible, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also subscribe on YouTube to get updates every week. You can always visit howwecanheal.com backslash podcast to share your thoughts and ideas. I love hearing from you, so keep your comments coming. If you'd like to stay connected in between episodes, you can also text me. Text the word HEAL to 888-858-0811. That's 888-858-0811. I went for the number with a lot of eights in it. I'll send you some inspiration and support a few times a month, and you can text me back there too. Before we wrap up, I want to be clear that this podcast isn't offering any prescriptions. It's not advice or any kind of diagnosis. Your decisions are in your hands, and we encourage you to consult with any relevant healthcare professionals you may need to support you through your unique path of healing. I'd also like to send thanks to our guests today to Christine O'Donnell and Celine Baumgartner of Bright Sided Podcasting, and to everyone who helped support this podcast directly and indirectly. Alex, thanks for taking the dogs out while I record. Lastly, I'd love to give a shout out to my big brother, Matt, who passed away in 2002. He wrote this music, and it makes my heart so happy to share it with you now. <laughs>